So I want to start by taking you back to a night in June 2013. And on this night, I was walking across this pineapple plantation, headed towards this patch of rainforest that was floating like an island in a sea of pineapple. I was there as part of my PhD research, which was investigating how the expansion of these intensive monoculture pineapple plantations affected wildlife, specifically bats. So it was quite a great adventure. Each night I would go to a different patch in a different pineapple plantation and set up these huge nets and trap bats as they flew through the understory. And even though these forests were little patches in pineapple, they had amazing biodiversity. So on a lucky night, my field assistant and I might see a tapir or a pygmy owl or something terrifying called a bullet ant. But this night that I'm telling you about was a little different. So we went into this forest patch and we went to set up our nets by a stream where we had set them up before. And on other nights there, we had been able to see really amazing biodiversity at this stream. I once saw a fishing bat swoop down and catch a minnow right out of the stream. And another night I saw ocelot tracks right on the bank. But this night was different. This night we saw something really terrible. The forest was quiet and the stream was filled with dead fish and frogs. So at this point, I'd been working in pineapple plantations long enough to know exactly what had caused this. And it was the pesticides that were applied to the pineapple washing down and poisoning the water. Even though this is my first time seeing this, these are regularly reported in pineapple plantations. So I knew that night in the forest that this is actually not unique. It was just one battle in the global war of industrial agriculture on biodiversity. So elsewhere, tropical forests were being cleared to make way for oil palm plantations. Poorly managed cattle grazing was destroying grasslands and pesticides were being sprayed on crops and decimating honeybee colonies that farmers rely on to pollinate everything from apples to almonds. The global scale and the global impact of industrial agriculture are really astonishing. We have converted more than 50% of the Earth's surface to the ice and desert free surface to agriculture. Agriculture accounts for more than a quarter of our greenhouse gas emissions, and we use about 70% of the available fresh water to irrigate our crops and to water our livestock. And we have an unbelievable amount of livestock. It's estimated that 94% of mammal biomass on Earth, if you take out humans, is livestock. So imagine that. Of the 28,000 species listed as endangered on the IUCN Red List, 24,000 of them are endangered in some part because of agriculture. So hopefully by this point, you're reaching the same conclusion that I did on that night in the forest. If this is how most of our food is grown, this isn't gonna keep working. We need to find something different. And tonight, I'm going to tell you part of what we can do differently. But first, let me tell you the challenge ahead of us. So right now, there's about 7.9 billion people as we sit here right now. But our population is projected to grow to about 10 billion by the end of the century. And to feed that amount of people, the FAO projects that we're going to need to grow about 60% more food than we do right now. So this is a huge challenge, but I think that we can meet it. We need to produce more food while doing less damage to biodiversity. And there's two ways I'm going to tell you about that we can do it. I really think we can rise to meet this challenge. There's a lot of innovations out there, but the two I'm going to talk to you about tonight are sparing land for biodiversity and precision agriculture. So sparing land for biodiversity, I'll tell you about first. What does that mean? It basically means strategically setting aside some parts of farms to return to natural habitat and then growing crops on the parts of the farms that are best suited for growing crops. It means avoiding huge, extensive monoculture plantations of tea or soybeans or corn or oil palm that just stretch for miles with no break. And this can often be accomplished with just small changes in cultivation practices. So I'll give you two examples. 
going back to that pineapple plantation in Costa Rica, my research found that if the forest patches were not further apart than 500 meters, then bats could travel across those plantations just fine. And my genetic connectivity data showed that this little bat, the chestnut short-tailed bat, would be able to travel through those pineapple plantations and get to where it was going with no problem at all. Now, this could be achieved by protecting forests in strategic areas like they've done along stream banks and in areas where roads move, there's roads for equipment and on slopes where it's kind of hard to grow crops anyway. Now, this is really exciting for this bat that this plantation is traversable for it, but you might also say, wow, we set aside all this land and we just saved one little bat. But most of you probably know in nature, everything is connected. So by protecting this bat in this landscape, we also protect the more than 500 species of native plants that this bat disperses the seeds of. And that means that these isolated forest patches have a chance to stay diverse and to thrive and to keep on providing the clean water and the fertile soil and the pollinators and the natural predators of, of crop pests that the farmers need to keep growing their crops. So I'll give you another example. In Europe, governments have started a lot of programs to teach farmers how to spare land for agriculture while not losing money. And one example of this is in Slovakia. You see that field with the red poppies? That's next to a potato field. And farmers started doing this because studies showed that planting those strips of poppies increased the abundance of birds and insects that ate the crop pests of potatoes. And by planting these poppy strips, you could reduce the number of crop pests by up to 75%. In this other picture, that's a wheat field in Switzerland. And in similar studies there showed that by planting wildflower strips next to wheat, they could reduce the population or the amount of damage that was done to the wheat by up to 60% because they provided habitat for natural predators. So this shows that you don't have to lose money to spare land for biodiversity. It often results in an increase in profits because the farmer doesn't have to spend money on pesticides and reaps a higher yield in many situations. So the second piece I'll tell you about comes in handy now because so we've say we've successfully set aside land for biodiversity. Well, remember, we need to grow 60% more food on the land that's remaining. That's a high bar. And so we need to do something differently on that land too. And I think that precision agriculture could be one of the answers. So precision agriculture is basically the use of technology to optimize farming. What does that mean? That means that, for example, you can use drones and soil sensors to map a farmer's field in terms of the soil pH, the soil nutrients, the temperature, and then the farmer can look at that data and decide which parts of the farm are best, are going to be produce the best crops and which parts would be better spared for biodiversity because they're not as productive. Then once your crop is planted, you can use soil sensors to figure out what the soil moisture level, again, the pH, the nutrients, and even pest outbreaks at specific plant places on the farm. And then the farmer can go in and target those areas with fertilizer or pesticides or irrigation as needed instead of spraying them across the whole farm. So this saves money in pesticides, it saves irrigation, and it benefits the environment because there's fewer chemicals in the environment. It also leads to a higher yield because every plant gets exactly what it needs right when it needs it. So one of the challenges to precision farming is that it's not as accessible for small farmers because they don't have the capital needed to invest in these technologies and they don't have the knowledge needed to operate the technologies. And also, as you may know, in many, many rural areas of the world, internet connectivity is still pretty poor. But there's a lot of organizations out there working to address these challenges. So these organizations are developing things like low-cost drones, uh, durable soil sensors, and efficient shared data management systems that can help make precision agriculture accessible to small farmers. An example of this 
is the nonprofit Precision Agriculture for Development. And what they do is essentially provide that bridge so that small farmers and uh, they target developing countries can make use of these technologies, even if it's on a basic scale. So one example here is this farm, this project that they did in Kenya with sugarcane farmers. And what they did there was deploy an agricultural information sharing system just through text messaging, where this organization went in and collected information on pest outbreaks and then was able to text farmers to tell them what was happening regionally and provide better information about when pests were coming so they could do targeted sprays instead of just sprays every X amount of time. Farmers could also upload their own data to help build that database. And in the first year, they saw an 11.5% increase in their yield. That's pretty good. Simil in a similar project that they did in India, the farmers had an issue with buying pesticides and applying them only according to the advice of the company that produced and sold them because they didn't have access to other information. So this company, uh, excuse me, Precision Agriculture for Development was able to take, collect local data and um, provide that to the farmers so that they could use more effective pesticides but fewer of them. And using that process, they were able to increase their yield in cumin by 28% while using fewer pesticides. So I see this as really good news. And what I see is that we do have some solutions in hand. We have some, some real advances and innovations in the agricultural field, some of which are old techniques that have been used for thousands of years, but we're bringing them back, like sparing land, and some of which are completely new, like using technology to optimize farming. But by using them together, I think that we really can meet this challenge of producing more food while doing less damage to biodiversity. So I'm going to tell you two steps you can take to push that process forward. Now, you can't go to the grocery store after this and look up products that have sustainable, that have land sparing for biodiversity or precision agriculture. It's not a label, right? But maybe it will be in the future. Maybe you can help push that forward. But in the meantime, there are some steps that you can take to make the impact of your food on biodiversity less than it is. One of those things is to shop at your local farmer's market. Now, what does local mean? If you live in a big city, it means something really different than if you move, live in a small rural area. But every mile less that your food travels benefits the environment. And it, it has been in the past that farmer's markets are not ex accessible to everybody, right? They only are in certain areas. They're not in very small rural areas or in um, urban centers, but that's changing. Since 2000, the number of farmers markets in the US has grown from 3,000 to almost 8,000. And many of those newer ones are in urban centers. This farmers market in the picture is in Astoria, Queens, and it's sponsored by the city of New York's Grow NYC program. So there's a lot of I initiatives out there nationwide working to increase access to farmers markets through city sponsorships and mobile market vans so that we can increase the number of people who have this option. Now, the other criticism of farmers markets is they're too expensive, but that's generally not true that they're more expensive than grocery stores. Large-scale studies have been done by the Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture and more recently by the Northeast Organic Farmers Association, and they have showed that conventionally grown produce, on average, is about the same price at the grocery store and at a farmers market. Well, what about the holy grail, organic produce? Well, that's actually cheaper at farmer's markets. So this is good news. The second way you can vote with your fork is a little harder. It's going to the grocery store every time you shop and looking for these labels, like organic, sustainably certified, and if it's on there, local. Now, right now, this is generally more expensive. But it's not more expensive because it's inherently more expensive to produce food that doesn't hurt biodiversity. It's more expensive because the vast majority of our food is grown on conventional industrial farms. And most of our subsidies 
and support systems go to those farms and most of our transport and packaging systems are set up for that kind of food. So it's an economy of scale issue. And I feel strongly that those among us who have the ability to purchase these foods really should, because we're gonna help move this along towards an economy of scale where everybody can afford it. So I hope that you have been convinced that it is possible to grow more food while doing less damage to biodiversity and to feed 10 billion people in the process because that's where we need to go. And if we all do what we're able to and if farmers get the support they need to transition to these methods like sparing land for agriculture and precision agriculture, then hopefully visitors to these isolated forest patches in Costa Rica in the future We'll be lucky enough to see the same amazing biodiversity that I was privileged enough to see when I was there all those years ago. Thank you. Thank you.